We are continuing, as you know, a study of the history of God's people. We have moved this fall to a consideration of the events and people related to the Pacific Northwest, which we are all interested in, since we happen to live right here. We've noted the triggering event, and I'm going to keep returning to this and really pick it up more in earnest in a couple of weeks, was when those four Nez Perce showed up at the office of William Clark asking for the white man's book of life. And that did spark a widespread response throughout the East Coast, especially among Christian people who were part of that second great awakening, which was really causing folks to think about the extension of the gospel to other places in the world. And the birth of the modern missionary movement was part of that impulse as well. We've looked at some of the kind of pre-missionary characters. Uh, We've looked at David Thompson and uh, Jedediah Smith. We considered last time we were together Jason Lee, who's really the first bona fide missionary, and he came in response to those Nez Perce. The second wave, I won't even call it a wave, but the second uh, people that really came after Jason Lee in 1834 were the Whitmans and the Spaldings, and they came out in 1836. And so we want to take up the story this morning of Marcus and Narcissa Whitman, who were Presbyterians, and also next week we'll be looking at Henry and Eliza Spaulding, who were Presbyterians. So the first folks on the block were Methodists, that was Jason Lee, but we Presbyterians were not too far behind. And of course you know that Whitman established a mission in what's called Wallot, I always have trouble saying Wallotpu, down near Walla Walla, and uh, Spaulding's at the area that we now regard as Lapway, Idaho. So next week we'll look at the Spaldings. The week after that, I want to look at two African-American gentlemen who came out as part of that wave. They didn't come as missionaries. They actually had their roots back in the slave status of the early days of American history. They were able to gain their freedom, and they came out west hoping to escape some of the discriminatory policies that were commonplace back east. They found that things weren't a lot better out here in the Pacific Northwest, but nevertheless they both had a huge impact. And they have names that you've heard, but you may not know that these are the original possessors of, well, sort of the original possessors. One of the guys was named George Washington, and the other guy was named George Washington Bush. (laughs) I'm not making this up. And so we want to look at them uh, about two weeks out, I guess, three weeks out, and we'll be considering their career. And then the last uh, two weeks of this kind of five-week segment, I'm going to turn our attention to Chief Spokane Gary, who, of course, we're very interested in as part of our uh, own heritage here in the region of Spokane. I'm going to crowd the story of Chief Spokane into two weeks, and even then I won't do him justice. He's a wonderful, remarkable character who I think is widely misunderstood in contemporary thought about him. So I'm hoping to rehabilitate a little bit of our appreciation of the Christian core that really drove so much of what he courageously represented at the time of the kind of intermixing of the white population that was coming in in earnest and the native population that was trying to deal with that uh, new representation of people around here. We'll have another week off at that point, and that will be the uh, altogether Sunday, kind of in the late November, and then two more weeks in this series. The first one will be dealing with George Whitworth, the founder of Whitworth University, and then finally we'll be looking at the history of our own uh, First Presbyterian Church, Spokane. So that's the agenda for the uh, rest of the weeks we have together. As we think about uh, Marcus Whitman, the story is complicated and in many ways is not pretty. And I have reflected more and more on this, of course, in preparation for this presentation, and I just can't help realizing there's a lot of loose ends here. We're just going to be dealing with some of these missionary experiences that are not tidy, but nevertheless do represent part of what it is to be extending the gospel into parts of the world where people may not have any familiarity with it at all. And I think some mistakes were made. They were made, unfortunately, on both sides of this particular enterprise. 
and it led to that catastrophic moment you've all heard of, the Whitman Massacre, which we'll be considering this morning as well. I think that the Whitmans knew that there were problems coming. They felt the tension for some years prior to that incident that took place in 1847, and I suppose that Marcus Whitman resorted again and again to confidence that he would derive from the biblical counsel that even though we sometimes don't know how to do what we ought to do, Paul says we don't know how to pray as we ought to pray. We are constantly beset with our own incompetence when it comes to doing the Lord's work, and yet God is still in it. And he's still accomplishing his purposes through us and in some ways in spite of us. And so we take great courage in the promises of Scripture that God is working in our efforts as sometimes misguided as they may be. I'm not saying the Whitmans were misguided, but at this point I think everyone was aware that there were some things that were kind of uh, going off the rails a little bit as time went on. So it reminded me of the text from the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8, the last part of that section. You're all familiar with it. I'm sure that Marcus Whitman himself and his wife Narcissa resorted to this text more than once for encouragement in their own understanding of what they were called to do. So listen to these familiar words from the Apostle Paul, Romans 8, beginning at verse 31, the Word of God. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it's written, for your sake we're being killed all day long, we're accounted as sheep to be slaughtered? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else, in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let's uh, have a word of prayer, and we'll get underway. Our Father, we are grateful once again to have the opportunity to review these remarkable lives, ordinary people used by you in most extraordinary ways to accomplish purposes that would be far greater than anything they might have imagined. We thank you that we can take a look this morning at the Whitmans for the way in which you use their lives to accomplish so many powerful and wonderful things, most of which they never lived to see. We pray that our reflection on their lives would be true to the facts of history, as complicated as they are, that we would be able to, with a certain Christian mature detachment, appreciate the good things and also the problems, and in all of it realize that you have been at work to bring glory to the name of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All righty. Well, we've been thinking about the mission to the Pacific Northwest, and we have so far looked at Jason Lee and his nephew, Daniel, we've looked at Cyrus Shepherd, who came out with them, and we're now taking a look at Marcus and Narcissa Whitman, and as I say next week, we'll consider the Spaldings. You know that the Whitmans are Americans, not Canadians. We've had some, of course, uh, Jason was Canadian. He's really the first American missionary, therefore. He was a physician. He was a missionary to the Oregon Territory before it was a territory, but certainly this region down around Walla Walla. He established a mission for the Cayuse Indians in that region, and that later became an important stop along the Oregon Trail, and that is part of the story. That's part of what complicates the story, is that the mission 
almost became as important for a way station along the Oregon Trail for white settlers as it did in its original vision for the native population, and that created part of the tension that led to the ultimate unhappy outcome of this story. The city of Walla Walla, as you know, developed as a direct result of the presence of the mission in that area. Whitman was born in New York City in 1802. He was the paternal descendant of John Whitman, who was one of the very earliest settlers in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And so that rich Puritan tradition came down to him, and I think it was in his DNA. His father died when he was only seven years old, and as a result of that, Marcus went to live with his uncle in Massachusetts. And so at that point, he really was enculturated into that Massachusetts Bay tradition, which deeply uh, went back to the Puritan presence of some years earlier. He dreamed of being a minister. Now, to be a Presbyterian minister in those days meant you had to be educated almost beyond all reason, and you had to go to advanced education to get the kind of requisite credentials to hold yourself out as a minister of word and sacrament. And so, because he couldn't afford that, he settled for second best and became a doctor, you see. So, uh, he went to work as a... Uh, a uh, physician, apprentice really, in New York, beginning around 1820, a couple of years later, he graduated from a credentialing organization, the Fairfield Medical College in New York, and then he practiced medicine for some eight to ten years or so in Canada, always entertaining the thought, however, sort of nurturing that ministerial impulse within him that he wanted eventually to go and be a missionary doctor. When I say out west, he wasn't necessarily thinking of as far west as we are, but certainly west of where he was, where there were many natives who were needing the kinds of skills that he would be able to bring. But when these four Nez Perce Indians showed up in the office of William Clark asking for the white man's book of life, that, as I say, sparked this widespread interest, and Marcus Whitman was certainly one of many who was touched by that, and decided that maybe his call would be to the further west, out to the Pacific Northwest, from whence these Nez Perce had come. He applied to the American Board of Commissioners for foreign missions in, 19, in 1834, but was denied because he wasn't regarded as having enough uh, good health. But later he kept banging on the door, you know, and was finally accepted in that regard. His first trip out west was just a one-year excursion. He went with a fellow named Samuel Parker, who was kind of a revivalist preacher, who was one of the forces kind of whipping up interest in missionary work. He was not himself a missionary, but he did want to go out west and take a look. And so Marcus Whitman, as a single man, traveled along with Samuel Parker, and they came all the way out west through Montana and wound up right in this region of Idaho, south of us, and there they were astonished at what they found. Because they found that there were many tribes in this region that had some sense, you would almost say a kind of sense of the Christian faith without any clear-cut exposure to the Christian faith. Now by this time, Spokane Gary had been around the block a few times. He had been here and he was clearly a Christian preacher. He'd been in the region ever since his days at Red River, since about 1830, and he traveled around kind of like a circuit preacher, and he was giving a rudimentary sort of presentation of the gospel and extending that prophecy that had been there for generations of a day when people with pale faces would come with a book and it would be the book of the words of the Great Spirit. And so Spokane Gary was a player, a significant personality at this time, at this point. And in some ways, that's what Parker and Whitman encountered, was a native population that seemed to have some very intriguing instinct toward the Christian faith, a great receptivity toward it. As it turns out, these folks that met Whitman just basically put the squeeze on him, you've got to come back. You have to come back here, and he promised he would. And so that brief encounter with them was all that Whitman needed to make a personal kind of commitment that he was going to come back and settle here among these and continue a Christian ministry among them. He returned to New York in 
and immediately began preparing in earnest for a much more long-term commitment to mission in that region. While he was there, he married. He married Narcissa Print, uh, Printess uh, in 1836. She was a teacher. She was uh, schooled in physics, in chemistry, and she also had a deep interest in missionary activity but could never do so as a single woman and so it was partly a marriage of professional commitment and partly a marriage of personal attraction and love but so on it made a wonderful team and the two of them went on their way. Some of you have visited the interpretive center that's down at uh, Wolapu in the uh, area around uh, Walla Walla there and the Whitmans are really celebrated there and rightly so. These are a couple of uh, kind of vignettes of the descriptions you'll run into there. Marcus Whitman descended from good in uh, New England stock characterized by both intellectual and moral strength. Mrs. Whitman was not a quote coarse and unlettered plainswoman but gently bred and well educated. That's the description. She herself wrote, surely my heart is ready to leap for joy at the thought of being so near a long desired work of teaching the benighted ones. And so that was from her own journal. And these are the two that began this mission to the Northwest. Before they left, Marcus Whitman recruited a fellow Presbyterian minister by the name of Henry Spaulding. He was married to Eliza, and so the two couples actually made this venture together, and they took along one man, a single man, whose name was William Gray. William Gray was sort of a missionary handyman. He wasn't a preacher or a theologian, but he was a good carpenter, and he knew how to fix the plumbing, you know? So he was a guy they brought along more for the utility of the contribution he would make. As it turns out, William Gray turned out to be a little bit of a problem before they were done, and we're going to see that uh, as we go along. But anyway, they go off, they join some fur traders, that was the standard way to get from here to there, and so off they went, and this is the first documented wagon train. Marcus Whitman. I don't know how many of you, I grew up on wagon train. You know what I'm saying? 1950s, I loved it. Clint Eastwood, back when he was a young man, you know, riding out there. So, I, uh, so this, this, means, uh, this means a lot to me. Uh, this was the first wagon train, and it was a Christian thing. I saw wagon trains even were a result of Christian enterprise. But it was a short train. There was only seven wagons in it, so it was a fairly short, modest wagon train. But they took off in 1836. They arrived at a fur trader's rendezvous on July 6th. They used the South Pass, which had been discovered, mapped, surveyed, described by Jedediah Smith. And so here's the work of Jedediah Smith, which now paves the way in some ways for this first missionary excursion that came along. Narcissa Whitman took meticulous notes. Her journals are absolutely fascinating to read, and this is her handwriting. I want to just read a couple of snippets just to give you a flavor of the way that she would write. This was before they left. This was right like the, the day before they departed, April 7th, 1836. She wrote, quote, The way looks pleasant, notwithstanding we are so near encountering the difficulties of unheard of journey for females. Her descriptions become somewhat more terse as we go along. This is on August 2nd, a couple of months later, quote, heat excessive. Truly thought the heavens over us were brass and the earth iron under our feet. By the time they made their first pass through Fort Walla Walla, before they'd settled there, she writes this, quote, the fatigues of the long journey seem to be forgotten in the excitement of being so near the close. Soon the fort appeared in sight. And so you can tell her own enthusiasm. The Oregon Trail looks like this. This is the course that they took. And of course, there were literally thousands of others who would come in the succeeding years using this very trail that they, in a sense, blazed at this time. Well, Marcus and the others with him wound up at Fort Vancouver, where the Hudson Bay Company was maintaining a trading post, as you know. They resupplied there, kind of refreshed themselves, reprovisioned, and then returned to this region inland around the region we would call Walla Walla. On arrival, Narcissa was actually expecting their first child. They arrived in December 1836. 
they met an interesting competitive spirit among the Nez Perce and the Cayuse. Both wanted them. You have to stay here. No, you have to stay here. And so there was this kind of almost bidding contest. Who gets the missionaries, you know? And as it turns out, they decided to divide the responsibilities. And so Spalding actually moved about 100 miles east and settled with the Nez Perce in the region of Idaho around Lapway there, the Cayuse in the region around Walla Walla. The Nez Perce actually warned Whitman, don't, don't trust those Cayuse, you know. Now, I don't know how much was just kind of playing around, how much was serious, but in any event, there, it is documented, and Whitman actually notes the Nez Perce warned him, and that we would put in the vernacular to watch your backside kind of thing. So anyway, and, and it turned out to have some truth to it, although there's certainly two sides to this story, as we'll see. Anyway, uh, he got underway. He built the Walaptu Mission, uh, about six miles east of present-day Walla Walla, there's a wonderful facility there. If you're ever traveling through and have a five or ten minutes extra, you should drive in, take a look. It's well worth your uh, time to uh, take a look at that particular facility. Tragically, the daughter who was born to them, Elise Clarissa, uh, born 1837, drowned in the Walla Walla River just at the mission there when she was two years old. They actually have a little kind of sign indicating the place where she died. This was absolutely, as you can imagine, incalculably devastating to both of them, especially to Narcissa. They never had any other children, uh, and in some ways I think it's safe to say that from that point on, the, uh, their relationship was, was, was joined kind of in this deeply painful memory of the loss of a little girl who had brought them so much joy. So this was just the first of many a hard experiences that they had along the way. At the same time, there were many successes. Whitman built a simple house that they moved into. Narcissa was absolutely ecstatic. Her descriptions of this house, you would think she was moving into the Taj Mahal. She was so thrilled at this uh, modest little uh, structure that was provided for them, uh, that he built actually. Marcus farmed, provided medical care, he wrote in one of his early letters back to the mission board that he represented, quote, we have two meetings for the Indians on the Sabbath, and in the evening a Sabbath school for the children and youth. Lately I've been explaining the Ten Commandments and our Savior's first and great commandment to which they listen with great attention. There was a vast and significant interest. This was not a problem of getting people to even pay attention. There were huge numbers in the native population that were highly receptive, so much so that it was somewhat stunning, I think, to the Whitmans and the Spaldings to find this kind of responsiveness as if the way had already been prepared, and indeed, I think it had been, a case I want to make for you uh, sometime later. Narcissa also uh, started a school in the kitchen of their little home. She writes to her parents, quote, We've had a school for them for about four months past, and much of the time our kitchen has been crowded and all seem very much attached. So again, there was a very positive response to this. Narcissa continued, our purpose was to bring the gospel to the Indians and to teach them the arts of civilization, particularly agriculture and horticulture. How can we think it? That if once succeed in getting good crops of corn and potatoes, that they will leave them for the scanty and laborious system of root digging. It would not be long before we should see them located around us with houses, fields, gardens, hogs, cows, and their children enjoying the benefit of constant instruction. Of course, these folks were living as hunter-gatherers. And so when the Whitmans came and the Spaldings came, they had what was truly advanced technology in terms of agriculture, and they were doing everything they could to not simply proclaim the gospel, which was the core of their ministry, but also to try to give to these folks the broader benefits of uh, these approaches to food production, that sort of thing. They built a flour mill, they built a sawmill. Most of the Cayuse were warmly appreciative and responsive to the education they were receiving in practical arts of agriculture, but some were resistant. And this is really the first harbinger of the problems that would eventually develop. Some of the Cayuse especially thought this was an insult to the earth to plow it up like that, that we should simply 
use what the earth naturally produces and in some ways a kind of animistic theology inspired them to doubt whether it was appropriate to do this sort of thing. So even though for the most part there was a fair amount of receptiveness to this education, there was already a little bit of resistance to it among some of these who they were ministering toward. Marcus himself as a physician would travel quite a ways from home making trips of up to 100 miles at times to provide care. There were various, of course, diseases and sicknesses and injuries and so on, and he would travel on horseback, sometimes at some risk, in order to provide health care as best he could within the limits of his own um, uh, you know, practical circumstances. There was a very unfortunate incident that took place involving William Gray. I'm not going to blame it all on William Gray. I think he probably didn't mean anything quite as sinister as it may seem when you hear the story, but nevertheless it did represent a very unfortunate kind of uh, uh, fly in the ointment to the whole story here. But what was, what was happening was the, the Whitmans had a, a nice little farm, a kind of garden, truck farm almost, that was very productive. And, and then there were uh, some of the natives that were coming in and just stealing stuff, you know, stealing corn, stealing melons, stealing this and that. And uh, Whitman was willing to allow that. He was trying to teach them about the Ten Commandments and thou shalt not steal. And he liked to use this more, as, more or less as kind of an exhibit, an, an, a lesson, you know. William Gray was a little more practical. He went out and actually injected some chemicals into some of the melons. And, uh, so, and it wasn't intended to kill anybody, but it was intended to make them kind of sick. And it did. And so as a result of that, the rumor began to spread that these missionaries, now th again, I, want, I don't want to overstate this, so I need to be careful how I say it. The rumor spread, but it was always among a decided minority of the native population, especially the Cayuse, that the Whitmans had actually come to wipe them out, you see, and that uh, they weren't there for their good at all, and all of this was kind of a hypocritical pretense. Uh, now, most did not accept that, but there were some who were entertaining that particular notion, and one of the most important of them was a character by the name of Chief uh, Tilokite, I'm going to pronounce it. I don't know if Frank is here to correct my uh, pronunciation. I guess he's not, so I can get away with anything. Here we are. So I'm going to call him Chief uh, Tilokite. I believe that's roughly correct. Marcus details the confrontations that he had with the chief following this incident involving William Gray, and I've just mentioned three of them. There's more than these, but these were the ones that seemed the most interesting. The, one, the first I'm calling the cornfield incident. This Cayuse chief, Chief Telokite, came and actually turned his horses loose in the cornfield that had been uh, uh, planted by Whitman, and the horses were out trampling stuff and eating the corn and you know, so on, and Whitman confronted him and said, you know, this is a cornfield, and it's probably better to let the corn grow and, and use it for human consumption rather than letting the horses trample it like this, but he was willing to allow it. He was actually being quite cordial with the chief, and the chief, of course, was being a bit of a bully, I think it would be safe to say, at least as reported here, and saying, well, this isn't your land anyway. You know, you're, who gave you this land? And Marcus was saying, well, your people gave me this land, actually, to farm it. And so they had this kind of unfortunate uh, interaction. I think Whitman, at least by his own description of it, behaved himself uh, reasonably well. But Tillokite was kind of pounding him on the chest, trying to pick a fight. That was really what was going on. There was a few days later the, what I'm calling, ear incident, in which Tillokite, without knocking, just kind of burst into the kitchen and grabbed Whitman by the ear and was, you know, kind of jerking him around like that, at which time Whitman, of course, in true biblical fashion, turned the other ear. And uh, so it was again, uh, uh, but Tolokai just didn't have any appreciation. He said, you're not man enough to fight, you know, you're a coward, you're this, you're that. He just kind of made those sorts of accusations. Probably the most serious of these I'm calling the club incident, which again involved them breaking into the house in the middle of the day. Uh, they had an ax in hand. Uh, Whitman kind of got the ax away from him. And then Tolokai actually grabbed a club and was, was sort of posturing to swing it and Marcus Whitman stopped him from doing it, kind of the glancing blow there, and then Tilokite said to him, according to Whitman, you're just afraid to die. And Whitman responded, well, I'm not afraid to die, but I'm afraid to let you commit a sin, you know, and so he was, they were having that kind of... Uh, so anyway, this was early on, and all I'm saying is that there was at least a faction among these folks to whom they had come to minister that was behaving in a somewhat hostile fashion,
toward him. Whitman finally called together a meeting of the Cayuse chiefs, there's of course several uh, within this broad, broad tribe, and he said, uh, he records in his um, uh, journal, unless you protect us and enforce good order, we will leave. Uh, we came to teach you not to fight with you, and that did seem to settle things down, at least for a time, among the natives, but just about then, more problems with other missionaries. Isn't this, this is one of the sad commentaries is that sometimes we're our own worst enemies, you know, and so we have some other missionaries coming in 1839. Uh, this is kind of a second wave, uh, reinforcements coming out to help, but these guys in some ways, uh, you know, created more problems than they solved. One of them was named Smith. I want to talk to, about him a little bit next week. He went off to join with the Spaldings at Kamii, but the other one was a kind of a staunch, somewhat rigid Presbyterian missionary type named George Ells. Uh, and George Ells came and finally wound up working here in the Spokane area. And some of you may actually know there's a, a little kind of monument to his labors in this area uh, around here. But anyway, George Ells, Cushing, I'm not George, but Cushing Ells, uh, came and began work here. One of the great sad aspects of this moment, I want to treat this more when we talk about Spokane Gary, but one of the sad things is that Cushing Elves, at least as far as we can tell, had very little appreciation for Spokane Gary. Uh, here was a ready-made asset. Here was a man who was already doing Christian ministry among his own people and with some considerable positive effect. And yet Cushing Elves was rigid enough that unless you did it just precisely his way, you see, that it just wasn't worth paying attention to. And so unfortunately, what could have been a wonderful working relationship wasn't. And Cushing Ells and Smith and certain others who came out and had a rather kind of, I would say, skewed expectation about how missionary work should be done began writing letters of complaint about Spalding and Whitman back to the mission board. And their letters were persuasive enough that actually the board wound up firing Henry Spalding and closing Wallapu Mission for a time. Uh, so it was a very unfortunate kind of, you know, log jam that took place at that point. Well, Whitman and Spalding, they did whatever they could to try to patch things up with these guys to get on some kind of uh, common page, and they were somewhat successful so that even though they finally reconciled, the official uh, decision of the board remained intact, and that required the Whitmans to go back east and try to once again reinstate the mission and their own status with the board. So Whitman and Narcissa traveled back east in order to meet with the board. The board heard their appeal, decided in their favor. The Whitmans were reinstated. Spalding was rehired. And as a result of that, Whitman was given an opportunity to speak some. And there was a great deal of interest in his message, so much so that when he came back out in 1843, he led a wagon train populated by a thousand people. Not a thousand wagons now, but a thousand people. A very, very large group came out with him. So his own appeal at that point was, was quite powerful, but it did create problems on the back end. So the wagon train came along, and as these multitudes of people began showing up, that, of course, inspired even greater fear among the Cayuse, who now don't just have a few pale faces in their midst, but now just seem to be overrun with these who are coming from the east as settlers. When the Spaldings, or when the Whitmans returned to their mission, they found it in a really dilapidated condition. They began to rebuild it. There had been some looting. There had been some destruction of fire and so on. They were able to rebuild it, but now this is a critical point. Really, the vision of the missionary effort began to change because with all of these settlers who were coming in, it became almost as important and eventually more important to provide a ministry to the settlers who were coming as opposed to the original recipients of this ministry, the Nez Perce and the, or especially the Cayuse, and so we do see about this time, 1843, a little shift in the vision of the Whitman mission. Uh, Narcissa wrote on October 9th, 1844, 
Here we are, one family alone a waymark, as it were, or center post, about which multitudes will or must gather this winter, referring to multitudes of settlers. And these we must feed and warm to the extent of our powers. Blessed be God that he has given us so abundantly of the fruit of the earth that we may impart to those who are thus famishing. She wrote about the same time, I cannot write any more. I'm so thronged and employed that I feel sometimes like being crazy. And my poor husband, if he had a hundred strings tied to him, pulling in every direction, could not be any worse off, you know. So they're kind of overrun now with demands from all these different directions. But clearly it was the immigrant population that was at the heart of what was making things complicated for them. She writes, a tide of immigration appears to be moving this way rapidly. We are right on the way between the states and the Columbia River and are a resting place for weary travelers. Consequently, a greater burden rests upon us to be ready always. This moment, 1843, 1844, is really a critical turning point. I think you're gathering that. The original mission had been focused almost entirely on the native population. Now it seems the same Marcus Whitman, who had had so much to do with the native ministry there, now is at the center of a vast number of white settlers who are coming in. And they, of course, don't have anything of the same missionary spirit. These are settlers. They may or may not be Christians. They certainly don't have that kind of commitment to, uh, for the most part, you know, to this kind of Christian mission. And so you can tell that the demographics, kind of the critical mass of the whole culture was beginning to change at this point. And the Whitmans were in a tough spot. And I have to hand it to them. They were threading a very difficult set of needles at this point. Whether they made all the right decisions, I'll leave to your own assessment. But this was a bit of a turning point. To make matters even more complicated, they took in at this moment what were called the Sager orphans. The Sagers, husband and wife, and seven kids had come out in a subsequent wagon train. The mom and dad died en route. And so they left seven orphans. And when this wagon train came through on the Oregon Trail, stopped off at Wallapu, they said to the Whitmans, hey, how would you like to adopt seven kids, you know? And uh, the Whitmans at first were thinking, oh, there's no way we can do this. You know, we're already up to our eyeballs in, in uh, problems here. But they also had this deep sense that that's what God was calling them to do. Narcissa wrote in her diary, if the Lord casts them upon us, he will give us his grace and strength to do our duty to them. Those seven kids that they adopted together with kind of foster kids that they would have from time to time, they were typically caring for about 10 kids or so in their household. By the way, the Sager orphans, the oldest was 14, the youngest was less than one. And so that was quite a spread of kids that were now in their little tiny house that uh, was their um, residence. The Interpretive Center down near Walla Walla makes this description and kind of paints, I think this is at least a roughly accurate picture of the mission that was operating there. Marcus Whitman did or supervised farming, building fences to protect his crops, taking care of farm animals, milking cows, butchering a horse when needed, sawing logs to make boards, making adobe bricks, and much more. He held church services for hundreds on the Sabbath and regularly explained the Ten Commandments and our Savior's first and great commandment. He was also still a doctor, but now in a world much different from rural New York. And again, I want to emphasize that even though I'm kind of highlighting some of the negative you know, developments, the broad, broad population, even though things were changing, were still deeply appreciative. I think the evidence is clear and deeply receptive to the Whitmans and the Spaldings. But they were also feeling encroached upon, as you can well imagine, by these folks who were coming in. So it was a delicate problem for them as well. But for the most part, they were still continuing to be appreciative of uh, Whitman and his ministry. Being a doctor was a rather risky proposition because of the uh, perils associated with being a medicine man in general. Narcissa wrote that a chief, Untipe, got in a rage about his wife and told my husband while she was under his care that if his wife died that night, he should kill him. Uh, this was the price you paid if you were a medicine man and, and your patient died. Uh, so it was hard to get life insurance if you were a doctor back then, you get my drift. So this is uh, the kind of complicated life that the Whitmans are dealing with now in the mid-1840s. There's rising tension 
The Cayuse, at least some of them, are beginning to view these white settlers coming in with increasing hostility. You begin to have attacks, not really bloodshed so much, but more just malicious mischief. Uh, they would attack, they would harass, they would steal, they would uh, kind of terrorize and so on. And so the, the wagon trains that were coming through were constantly exposed to that. And this really did force Whitman to kind of step up and, and, and he did so in a way that was very much on, the, on behalf of the settlers and he took rather punitive acts and measures toward the natives who were involved in these acts. Narcissa herself, of course, with a house full of 10 kids, clearly, and she documents this in her own journal, began to give more attention almost by necessity to the children under her immediate care and less to the educational pursuits that had been part of her life earlier. The Whitmans, I think it's safe to say, gradually shifted their focus to the settlers who were coming in and shifted their focus away from the native population that had originally been there focus. Uh, Whitman said, I have no doubt our greatest work is to aid the white settlement of this country and to found its religious institutions. All of this was somewhat complicated by some other factors that began to develop. There were two natives who came from back east. One was a Delaware Indian whose name was Tom Hill and he began warning the Cayuse Indians that these whites were going to push you off onto something called reservations and that began to arouse some alarm bells among them. There was another Eastern native who came out, his name was Joe Lewis, and he actually began to spread rumors among the Cayuse that the Whitmans were simply here for a land grab, that they were simply gonna try as best they could to take all of your land away from you, and that began to arouse some concerns as well. As you can, if you can imagine, you know, what was going on here, and they began to wonder about the Whitmans and so on. But probably the critical moment came in 1847 when a wagon train showed up in which there were uh, several people who had measles and they were sick and the sickest of these who had the measles were actually dropped off at Wallapu for care until they recovered. Well, as you can imagine, the measles spread to a lot of the white settlers there and the natives alike. Uh, the white population basically had antibodies to uh, care for the um, uh, measles uh, disease and so most of them survived but this was absolutely devastating to the native population who didn't have any kind of resistance in their bodies to this. About half of one of the major tribes of the Cayuse died, almost all of them children, you see. And so that, of course, raised huge, I mean, this was just an agonizing moment, as you can imagine, not only for the natives, but for Whitman himself, who was doing everything humanly possible to try to care for these who were being infected by this disease. The Cayuse finally largely abandoned Whitman and turned to their own native uh, traditional therapies, sweat lodges, putting them into ice cold rivers, uh, that kind of thing. That didn't turn out to be much more effective than Whitman's efforts. Whitman wrote in a letter about this time of the pressures he was under. He said, quote, I have been one who even before I came among them have been held forth to them as a sorcerer of great power on account of my medical profession. You're already aware of their habit to kill their own medicine men as they are commonly called when an excuse offers by the death of some of their friends. So Whitman realized that as he was providing medical care to everybody who needed it and was still losing patients kind of right and left, that he was very much at risk because of the way in which things were shaping up. This is of course the, the kind of precursors to what we commonly call the Whitman Massacre. There did come to be a plot really to kill Whitman and those associated with his ministry. The details of it go something like this. Whitman and Spaulding were together at Wallapu. Spaulding had traveled there to bring his daughter Eliza, this is the daughter of his wife Eliza, and drop her off there for schooling at the school that was being operated at that mission. While they were there, they received a call from a village about 30 miles away to go and provide some kind of medical care because of some uh, issue there. This was on November 27th, 1847. 
Whitman and Spaulding together rode well into the night about 1 a.m. They came to a lodge that was operated by a Cayuse chief named Stikus. Stikus was a friend, he was a Christian convert, he was a staunch ally and supporter of Whitman, even though some of his, um, you know, some of those within his tribe were uh, taking a different view. But Stikus actually warned that Joe Lewis was poisoning the minds of these Indians and that this whole trip to the 30 mile away village was actually a setup and that the intention was to uh, attack them at that point. And so Stikus gave them a pretty significant warning. Uh, the record of it from uh, Whitman was, be careful for the bad Indians will kill you. Go away until my people have better hearts. So that was the warning from Stikus. Whitman decided that he was going to trust the counsel of Stikus, which was correct to do. He turned around and went home, went back to Wallapu. Spalding spent another day with Stikus. That's what saved his life. Uh, Spalding certainly would have been a casualty of this as well, uh, but he stayed there with Stikus at that point, preparing to return to his own home in Lapway. Well, the next day, uh, Whitman returned home. He got home late in the day and stood up, or stayed up that night caring for sick children. He woke Narcissa. Uh, this was well into the night when he returned home, told her of what Stikus had said. So together they're up that night, and it, uh, he was working all through the night. The next morning brought word of three more deaths uh, among native children. This is November 29th. Two of the dead children were children of the chief I was mentioning earlier, Tolokite. This, uh, the afternoon of the 29th, uh, Tolokite came with another chief whose name was uh, Tamohas, they kind of broke in, barged into the home. Uh, this is early afternoon now at the mission. Narcissa was in the kitchen. She ran into the living room. At the same time, Marcus, who was in the living room, ran back out in the kitchen. She bolted the door between the two, and Marcus came into the kitchen. He sat down and began trying to have a conversation with these two men, trying to calm them down and so on. As he was talking to Tamohas, the uh, record is that uh, Talaikut came around the back and hit him in the back of the head with a, a hatchet kind of weapon and knocked him out, knocked him to the floor. It didn't kill him right at that point. At the very same moment, there was an attack of the grounds outside the uh, Whitman mission there. Talukite and Tamohas exited the house. They went out. There were others in the house at the time who record this conversation between Narcissa and Marcus. Uh, Narcissa came back into the kitchen, found her husband there, of course, lying on the floor, uh, mortally wounded. Uh, she pulled him up. She said, do you know me? Uh, to which he responded, yes. She said, are you hurt badly? To which he responded, yes. And she asked him the question, is your mind at peace? To which he responded, yes. Narcissa then, according to the record, went to the kitchen window knowing that there was kind of mayhem breaking out outside. While standing there, she was shot and uh, knocked down. She kind of got back on her feet, went back to the record, or back, went back to the window. The record is that she said these words, quote, Lord, save these little ones. And then she collapsed and died. So both Marcus and Narcissa were killed November 29th, 1847. There were 11 others who were also killed in the massacre. The mission was looted, it was burned, and 47 women and children who were there as well were taken hostage by those who had been responsible for this attack. The Spaldings, uh, Henry, I'm going to talk about Henry's uh, adventures in this connection next week, but he made this, uh, uh, knowing of something of what was happening, made the trip back to Lapway where he was immediately welcomed and protected uh, with a great uh, courage and resilience by the Nez Perce. There was no way they were going to let uh, Henry or Eliza be injured. And so they were actually protected and came through unharmed, at least uh, physically, through this uh, incident. Well, as a result of this, officials of the Hudson's Bay Company paid a huge ransom to those who were holding the hostages and were able to obtain their release. As it turns out, it was the daughter of Henry Spaulding, was the only one who, was, uh, who had the 
co language competence to translate. She was about 13 years old and she served as the translator during these negotiations to release the hostages. Immediately, the missions were all closed. Uh, the survivors, including the Spaldings, uh, were all brought to Fort Vancouver and the protection of the Hudson Bay Company there. The American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions closed all of the Northwest missions in this region and they remained closed for some many years. The Cayuse War, as it was called, lasted for about two to three years in which there was a drastic reduction of the Cayuse population, almost to the vanishing point. As it turns out, the ones who did survive this conflict wound up joining with the Nez Perce and they, were, they really lost their distinct identity at that point. The incident, of course, as you can imagine, made front page news all across the eastern seaboard of the United States. Rather than dampening missionary fervor, it actually inspired even more and so you had many more missionaries coming out as a result of that. The two men who were generally regarded as chiefly responsible were these two, Telukite and Tamahas. Uh, they were uh, pursued by the Oregon militia for about three years. Finally, the Cayuse tribe, or what was left of them, uh, surrendered the five men uh, said to be guilty of the massacre. It was these two and, and three others were, were basically the people responsible. So it was a relatively small number. Tamahas um, reportedly said this as he turned himself in. I'm going to leave it to you to judge exactly what it means. Uh, but anyway, he said this. He said, quote, Our chief told us to come and see the white chief and tell him all about it. The white chief would then tell us all about what was right and what was wrong and learn us to live when we returned home. So I think the impression you get from that is that Tamahas turned himself in, both of these, expecting that they would maybe be punished. I don't think they expected to be executed as a result of this. And it does show a, at least a, an interesting um, sort of understanding of what was happening at that moment. And I, I leave it to you to interpret that, but that is the uh, quote that apparently was given. In any event, in 1850, the five who were involved were pronounced guilty. They were hanged in Oregon City. This is the sheriff who was responsible for that, a man by the name of Joseph Meeks. It turns out it's very clear that it was only a very small band of Cayuse that were involved in this. The five who were found guilty, partly found guilty on the basis of testimony from other Cayuse, and at least one of those five was later determined was very likely innocent, so it may have only been four that were actually responsible for this. Part of the impulse that made the Oregon Territory an Oregon Territory was an interest in establishing some sort of legal authority by which the, the uh, capture and execution of those responsible could take place. So it's a sad ending. I think we'd all agree that we could wish for something much different, but uh, missionary labors, especially in these days, was a high-risk occupation. It does highlight this difficulty that is part of the missionary spirit, because especially when missionaries who may come from fairly advanced civilization uh, come into situations where they see just evidently, you know, kind of screaming at them, the needs of the, of the moment, the needs of those to whom they are ministering, uh, there's a mixed uh, effect it can have. On the one hand, there's certainly this compassion, but there's also a kind of elitism that can become part of it. And unfortunately, that can sometimes do as much harm as good as I'm sure you can imagine. I don't know exactly what it looked like up close and personal with the Whitmans, but I think something of that was happening uh, that there came to be a sort of uh, superiority associated with the missionary presence that may have inspired some of this as well, but I would want to be very cautious not to overstate that. If you're ever visiting in this region, uh, this is the placard that, uh, that uh, highlights the Wallapu uh, area a short distance to the south near Walla Walla River is Wallapu, the place of the people of rye grass is what it means, a mission founded among the Cayuse Indians at the Walla Walla Valley in 1836 by Dr. Marcus Whitman and his wife Narcissa. As increasing numbers of immigrants moved into the Oregon country during the 1840s, Whitman Mission became an important station on the Oregon Trail. Cultural differences climaxed by a measles epidemic that killed many Cayuse ended the missionary effort. A few suspicious Cayuse 
took the lives of Marcus and Narcissa Whitman and 11 others on November 29, 1847. The grounds preserved through uh, early community efforts are now administered by the National Historic Site. So it's a great place to visit if you're ever in that region. What can we say about the legacy of, of Marcus Whitman? Well, Whitman College, Whitman County, Whitman Bank, you know, I mean, the list goes on. Certainly this man who uh, uh, was uh, remarkable in his own time has certainly left an even more lasting and endearing legacy. Uh, Candy and I, I hate to admit this to you, we stayed at the Marcus Whitman Hotel there uh, when we were in Walla Walla, and there is his initials. I don't think Marcus Whitman ever a day in his life stayed in facilities anything even remotely as nice as the uh, Marcus Whitman Hotel there. But uh, I think Marcus Whitman probably knew this verse and repeated it to himself more than once. If God be for us, who can be against us? The lesson I'd like to leave us with as we conclude is this. It's never tidy. You know, life is not tidy. History is not neat. There are always loose ends, difficult, jagged edges, because we are broken people. And we just do a lot of things wrong, you know. To me, it's one of the great evidences that God is sovereign and gracious, that he's accomplished so much good in history in spite of us, that he continues to do good things. And the long-term effect of the efforts of his people are ultimately to the glory of Christ, even though all along the way we may move in fits and starts. I say this as a word of encouragement. Sometimes, to be honest, if you don't mind the vernacular, I screw up big time. And I think to myself, what an idiot. What did I do that for? Why did I say that? But you know what? Even though we all are fraught with our limitations and uh, incompetencies, uh, nevertheless, never doubt this truth. If God is for you, who can be against you? Ultimately, God will bring glory to the honor of Christ. And it is, it is he that we serve. And even though we are very uh, uh, less than adequate servants, uh, God will simply, uh, in the end, make sure that these efforts are to his glory for his purposes.